right. Mike, good catching up. Armin, thank you for having me. So uh, we were just talking a little bit about um, your background. You run um, Invictus Research. You guys do really wonderful macro work um, and make it accessible to a lot of people. So, you know, like um, maybe let's start off, you know, why does macro matter? Why does the business cycle matter? Like why should people pay attention? Sure. So ultimately, I think the reason to pay attention to macro is because it drives a lot of the price action. When you look at indexes or asset classes at large, say stocks, bonds, commodities, and currencies, macro is really what drives everything. And even down at the single security level, uh, macro can drive upward of 70% of the price action in certain regimes. So if you want to know what's going on, even if you're a single security analyst, a bottom-up investor, uh, understanding the macro can give you a great advantage over your peers. And it can be a huge liability if you don't pay attention to it. So in my mind, understanding the business cycle has something to offer everyone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm talking to a lot of PEs uh, recently and they are interested in macro. And um, then, but they always kind of compare it a little bit to voodoo. So like, it's a little bit fuzzy. People don't, you know, fully understand it. Like, you know, what's your process? Like, how, how would you answer that? How would you respond to that? So I think macroeconomic analysis has a reputation for being esoteric or difficult to understand. And I think that reputation is propagated by certain participants in the industry that benefit from being difficult to understand and using challenging jargon and uh, sort of using verbal, you know, uh, you know, a sleight of hand to make it sound like they're always right, even when they're not saying something very specific. And even though macroeconomic analysis is not easy, it, it's it's hard, it is simple. In other words, the fundamental drivers of the business cycle and the fundamental drivers of asset classes, asset class price performance are relatively simple. It really comes down to the real growth cycle, the inflation cycle, and the monetary policy cycle. And those three sub-cycles form what we call at Victus the larger business cycle. And the business cycle is really what drives everything. It has a somewhat predictable sequence. It has uh, leading indicators that you can use. Uh, it follows economic logic, you know, linkages between different parts of the economy. And uh, there's also a lot of macroeconomic data too, especially relative to individual companies, right? So if you're looking at Apple, you have the different SEC filings, you can read sell side reports, maybe you can use some alternative data. But, but the truth is that, uh, there's so much more data about the overall economy. It's it's anything but voodoo. It's it's very quantitative. It's very um, uh, it's it's based in economic uh, theory where there's long academic uh, track records and validations for different ideas. So, uh, like I said, I think it's it's anything but voodoo. It and it's uh you know possibly the most important thing when you're when you're thinking about what actually drives the price action for given securities or asset classes. I couldn't agree more. And um, so like talking about the data and, you know, the, the theory behind this, um, you know, like what's the data telling us right now? What's the data telling you when clients approach you these days, you know, and you look at different charts, new kind of data releases coming out? Like what's the overall picture? Let's say I'll put the time frame to six to 12 months. Sure. So if I were to describe where we are in the business cycle using a phrase, I would say, we are in a late cycle slowdown headed toward a recession. Of course, the really important question is, when will that recession be? Because there are dramatically different implications if it's a month from now versus three months from now versus a year from now. So I'm going to lay out how we think about the business cycle and the sequencing of a late cycle growth slowdown so that you can think about uh, what are the signposts to look for on your way to a recession. So let's rewind the clock back to late 2021. What was happening? Well, inflation was picking up. The Fed was starting to realize that it was behind the curve a little bit. The Fed started to communicate to markets and market participants that it was going to raise rates. Uh, when the Fed says it's going to raise rates, usually they're talking about the Fed funds rate specifically, but the Fed funds rate is the policy rate or the benchmark rate for the entire U.S. interest rate complex. So when the Fed raises the Fed funds rate, that puts upward pressure on, well, one, the Fed funds rate two short rates, like the the uh, you know the one month, three month, uh, one year, two year bills. It puts upward pressure on the long end of the yield curve. So even the 10 year and the 30 year have 90% plus correlations with the Fed funds rate. Uh, 
And it even puts upward pressure on private market interest rates like mortgage rates. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a 93% correlation between the Fed funds rate and the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. So we're going to zero in on the 30-year fixed mortgage rate because this is one of the most important transmission mechanisms of monetary policy. So when the Fed raises rates and the mortgage rate goes up, the first impact of that is that it reduces demand for new homes financed with mortgages. And you can view that in the MBA purchase data, which is the data for mortgage applications for new home purchases, so not refinancings, uh, new home purchases. And more or less instantaneously, demand goes down. As soon as mortgages become more expensive, people don't want them as much because it's harder to finance a home that way. So uh, with less affordable mortgages becomes uh, comes fewer home sales. Has that happened the cycle? Yes. Total home sales, so new home sales plus existing home sales are down about 40% from their cycle peak. Uh, why does that matter? Well, housing is a leading indicator in its own right because housing drives a lot of goods consumption, specifically durable goods consumption. So what are durable goods? Technically, they're goods with a useful life of longer than three years. But what that really means is stuff like cars, furniture, home appliances like washing machines and dishwashers. They are the big financeable discretionary items that really drive most of the manufacturing cycle in the US. So uh, when you see the ISM manufacturing PMI or the FRB's industrial production data, what's really driving those time series? Well, it's really demand for these durable goods that I just talked about. And housing is what's really driving those demand, that demand a lot of the time. So why have we seen recessionary PMI data? Why have we seen really weak industrial production data? It's because the housing market is completely locked up as a result of 7% plus mortgage rates. So we've made it thus far in the business cycle. What's next? Well, industrial companies then cut production, right? Because demand is weak and companies can't sustain uh, states of such low production and such weak activity forever because it starts to compress margins because they have fixed costs, for example, personnel. And so what you see next is that manufacturing companies tend to start laying people off. And are we at that stage in the business cycle yet? As it turns out, yes. If you look at the BLS data on manufacturing employment, uh, we've seen, I don't know, layoffs in two of the last three months. If you look at the ADP manufacturing data, employment data, it's much worse for whatever reason. ADP is considered a little bit less reliable than the BLS data, but we consider it just as one data point among many. And, and according to ADP, we've seen almost 200,000 net layoffs in manufacturing. We've also seen that start to metastasize into other leading industry, industries, such as residential construction, transportation services, like trucking, um, temporary staffing. We've seen layoffs in, I think, all nine of the last nine months uh, in these sectors cumulatively. So we are starting to see weakness on the margins of the labor market. This is reflected in other data too, like wage growth, which is still high, but softening on the margins. And eventually this weakness, if it's going to become recessionary, metastasizes into the broader labor market, resulting in higher initial claims, higher initial jobless claims, which come out weekly, higher unemployment rate, et cetera, et cetera. And when you see the labor market start to weaken, that's when the NBER starts to really sharpen its pencils in terms of dating the recession usually. And um, look, our view is that is that we get to a recession. I think that the key variable to watch is interest rates. It's really just a question of how long the Fed will keep its foot on the throat of the housing sector and the manufacturing sector. And they're indicating that they are willing to do it as long as is necessary to see the necessary weakness in the labor market to bring down wage growth to a level uh, consistent with 2%. And ultimately, we think that the Fed will get what it wants. Our timing uh, is that we see a recession. Well, we see the We'll stick with the unemployment rate because the NBER determines recessions and who, who knows exactly what they'll do. Sure. We think that we see the unemployment rate tick up toward 4% by year end of this year and ultimately above 7% by August of 2024. So obviously that is a rather bold call. A 7% unemployment rate would indicate not only a recession, but a harder than average recession. And so uh, maybe I'll stop there, but that is that is what we're looking forward to at Invictus. And may I ask, because I, I got this question a lot in the past, is you're looking at an, on the employment side at manufacturing, right? Any particular, like, what's the reasoning? Because I think people looking a lot usually at the, you know, in the service sector where the picture might be still a little slightly better. So um, do you want to kind of, you know, um, run us through this? <clears throat> Sure. So the reason to look at manufacturing is that it tends to lead the broader growth cycle data. So it tends to lead services. 
And you can see this from looking at the PMI data. You can see this from looking at the inflation data, right? Inflation and in durable goods tends to lead inflation in services by about eight months. You see it more or less everywhere that you look. And the reason is because uh, the manufacturing sector is just more sensitive to interest rates, right? So I think that everyone knows the Fed creates money through bank reserves. But what a lot of people don't fully appreciate is that not only does the Fed create money, it also influences where that money gets spent, right? right. So if you have $100 in your bank account and interest rates are really expensive, you're less likely to spend that $100 on financeable, durable goods or goods related to the home. For example, buying a house or a couch or a car or something like that. And you're more likely to spend it on something that doesn't require financing, like tickets to go see Taylor Swift or Barbie or Oppenheimer or whatever. I've used this story before, but I'm looking at buying a couch from Costco and it's $2,000. For the average US consumer, $2,000 is expensive, even though Costco is sort of on the value end of furniture, right? So as a result, spending is getting squeezed into the services sector, which is why you see services sector spending is still kind of in the six to 7% range. Again, and not a level not consistent with 2% uh, inflation, not consistent with the Fed's target. And so essentially what you need to see is you need to see enough weakness in the manufacturing sector that it bleeds into the services sector through incomes and then consumption. That's what we think the Fed wants. That's how historical business cycles have progressed. And so that's the sequencing that we're watching at Invictus. And when you, when you talk about a recession scenario, like what kind of re recession do you kind of expect? Like draw a little bit of a picture. I mean, usually I guess, you know, when we go up, um, you know, quickly, we probably go down quickly or, you know, like um, it's always a level kind of, you know, if it, if it goes up a lot, it probably goes down a lot. Like, you know, like it's a, a simplified way how to think about stuff, but like what kind of like, you know, recession are we talking here? Sure. So there are plenty of puts and takes on this, and I'd be happy to ex expand on them to the extent you would like. But a generally good rule is that the speed and severity of the recession is commensurate with the speed and severity of the interest rate hikes that precede it. And you could also say the same thing about housing. The speed and severity of the recession is commensurate with the speed and severity of the downturn in housing that precedes it. So we have seen the most rapid increase in interest rates since Paul Volcker in the 1980s. And consequently, we've also seen the most dramatic downturn in housing. Now, you could make the case, and I think it would be fair to say that the U.S. economy is a little bit less sensitive to interest rates right now for a variety of reasons than in the past, but it's not insensitive to interest rates, right? And you can see that in the mortgage data, like I mentioned earlier. And those knock-on effects from housing still matter quite a bit. This is all to say we expect a more severe than average recession, which underlies our call for 7% plus unemployment rate. Okay. All right. That's uh, that's more than doubling up. Right. That would be a, a very serious situation. Okay. And, um, you know, when you, you know, when you look at it and what kind of data would prove you wrong? Like what would change your mind? In other words, what kind of data would you need to see? So there's really two, there's really two ways that we could be wrong. The first way is that we are in fact in a new, <laughs> in a new bull market, right? A new economic expansion. The second way we could be wrong is that the recession is later than we expect. So on the first point, what would change our minds? How, what would prove that we could be in a new expansion? It has to be lower interest rates. It really has to be lower interest rates. The, the manufacturing economy, the housing economy, the, you know, the automotive sector, it doesn't work with interest rates where they are today. It doesn't work with five and a half percent Fed funds rate and 7% plus mortgage rates for an economy that can only grow GDP at a percent and a half uh, in aggregate over the long term, right? So without lower rates, there is no durable economic expansion from here. So we have to see interest rates break first. What could draw up the cycle longer than we expect today? A variety of things. I mean, almost too many things to count, right? There's a lot of potential variability there, but I'll, I'll tell you one that I think about quite a bit, and it's that the cycle has been so, so short. You know, when, when COVID happened, every you know, manufacturing companies, but everyone was forced to lay people off because obviously economic activity ground to a halt and there was a great deal of uncertainty. So there were mass layoffs, right? We saw the most abrupt increase in unemployment ever in the US and, and probably around the world too. And uh, as a result, the Fed and the Treasury and Congress in the US sort of took out the stimulus cannons, 
right? And one consequence of that, one way of interpreting all of that stimulus was that the government and policymakers want companies to hire back all of those employees that they let go. So they let everyone go, they hired everyone back. And now, or just a few you know, months and quarters later, the Fed and policymakers are signaling the opposite. Wow, inflation's running too hot. We're gonna hike rates as fast as we have in four decades. So now the Fed is signaling to these companies again, hey, you need to fire people. So, hey, you need to fire people. You need to hire people. You need to fire people again. And this is all over the course of you know, three years or so. And there are logistical constraints to doing stuff like that. And there are also reputational constraints to doing stuff like that, right? If you're uh, running a business and you have a reputation for hiring and firing people you know, within the span of a couple of years, um, it's not a good look reputationally. And so I think it's a possible catalyst for manufacturing companies and other cyclical companies and just co the corporate sector in general in the U.S. holding on to employees longer than they otherwise would. And look, that could draw up the cycle another three to six months. That could be the difference between a recession and, you know, starting in December and a recession starting in uh, July. And so that's not our base case. We have a bunch of forward-looking models and, and predictors and leading indicators that all suggest the unemployment rate, the labor market will really start to crack hard in Q1 of 2024. But okay. it's, uh, it is possible. It's an edge case that we're, we think quite a bit about. And is there anything on the fiscal side that like you know that might change things for you so um fiscal policy has certainly been a tailwind for the u.s economy i mean when you look at the impact of fiscal policy on the various economic data one of the most direct impacts is on the labor market there's a very close correlation between how much money the government spends and the unemployment rate and so obviously we've seen considerable deficits over the last uh, few quarters you know the the uh, fiscal deficit divided by GDP is, you know, between seven and a half and eight and a half percent, depending on which number you look at. Very, very high. I mean, there's really no precedent for that outside of recessions and wars. And so essentially, the federal government has been spending money through the first half of 2023 as though there were an emergency, even though there obviously has not been an emergency. A lot of that spending is stuff that's going to turn off automatically, like cost of living adjustments to entitlements. It's not legislated, it's just sort of mechanically built into the spending. That'll turn off in the back half of this year. So we don't really expect that to persist. Um, and on top of that, like, look, the, the private sector is still 85% of the US economy. So while government spending does matter, uh, and it's something that we would never ignore, we think that the weight of the evidence, the gravity of the business cycle still suggests significant economic weakness in 2024 and that uh, the current government dynamic spend, uh, dynamics in terms of spending, um, they aren't going to change that. And, and they're probably going to become a headwind rather than a tailwind. So when, when I look at Q1, then it's time to position ourselves. So when you run a research company, what do you recommend your subscribers? Cannot be only like long, long government bonds. So um, is there right. anything in particular that you kind of, you know, usually recommend, you know, be it, be it maybe people in the real world economy or invest that wanna, investors that want to take advantage of it? Sure. So this, I think, is a time to be defensive. So right to be positioned in, in larger cap stocks, strong balance sheets, high quality, defensive sectors to the extent that good opportunities exist. So that would be stuff like healthcare, staples, uh, utilities. We think that the, the, the tide is turning in terms of those relative performance dynamics with cyclicals. Um, in terms of fixed income, treasury bills, in, in my mind, are a no-brainer. A nominally risk-free 5 to 5.5% five yield at this location in the business cycle just makes all the sense in the world. Historically, through recessions, the best performing asset has been long-term government bonds. We think people should be waiting to buy long-term government bonds. They should not be buying long-term government bonds yet. We can go into the logic of that more if you'd like. It's a little bit complicated. But essentially, for this cycle in particular, we do not think long-term government bonds will outperform until we really see the whites of the eyes of this recession. So in other words, you don't want to try and front-run the recession this time with government bonds. Um, Interesting. Can so, you elaborate yeah. a little bit? Maybe like the, the less complex version? Sure. So the bottom line is inflation is still running hot, right? If you look at... I'll just throw one number out there, services inflation, X energy. Uh, it's a, a very wage sensitive measure of inflation. 
closely connected to the labor market. It's still running at 4% on a three-month annualized basis, mm-hmm. and it's been running at 4% for the last three months. So essentially, the Fed isn't seeing the progress that it needs to see in terms of uh, labor market-driven, wage-driven inflation. And so we think that the Fed could hike one more time this year, but they're definitely not cutting. So that will keep long-term bonds bond yields high. Remember what I said earlier, there's a 90% correlation between the policy rate and the 10-year note yield, right? So if the Fed isn't cutting uh, the policy rate, that's going to keep the 10-year pretty high. In addition to that, you have $95 billion a month in quantitative tightening. Our work suggests that's the equivalent of about a 10 basis point rate hike every single month. And on top of that, you have the Fed, excuse me, the Treasury issuing about $2 trillion in new securities in the back half of this year, including almost half a trillion dollars in new coupon issuance. And what that means is notes and bonds, not bills. In other words, it's introducing duration into the market, which means it'll put upward pressure on the back end of the yield curve. So uh, think that the 10 year, 20 year and 30 year. And we expect that to be the equivalent of a 40 to 50 basis point rate hike. Now you're weighing this against economic conditions too, because the more the economy slows, that'll be putting downward pressure on the long end of the yield curve. But when you take the weight of the evidence at Invictus, we think that the uh, the tenure could easily have another 50 basis points, 75 basis points of upside, in which case you really don't want to own long-term bonds yet. And you look, you're getting paid five and a half percent to own the, the short the short end until then. And so we think, like I said, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Right. And the catalyst for buying the long bond will be the Fed cutting rates if you're looking for a catalyst. Interesting. Is there any other kind of like question that I should have asked you that I did not? No, I think that was a, that was a lot of good questions. I think you covered most of the important things going on right now. (laughs) Okay. Apart from Cassandra, Mike, like where can people follow your work? So our website is invictus-research.com. It's where we, we sell all of our research. We're actually introducing a few new products in the next six months. So that's going to be very, very exciting. And uh, I'm also on Twitter at Invictus Macro. Fantastic. Mike, thank you so much. That was helpful. Cheers. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.